Um, just to start with a very quick prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So, Father, we just pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on our thoughts and our minds, on what we're going to hear this evening, and on what we hear throughout the whole conference. And we just pray for an increase in wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So, I was delighted when Gary gave me the title for this talk, Reconciliation Through the Lens of Theology of the Body. The title is really just a lovely invitation. Theology of the Body is extending an invitation to all of us, an invitation to be reconciled with others and, above all, with God. But I suppose the key question that has to be answered is, what is it in us that needs to be reconciled? So in order to answer that question, my plan for this talk is the following. Firstly, I'm going to begin with a succinct statement regarding the teaching of the Catholic Church on sexuality and marriage. Secondly, many of us will have grown up knowing the what of what the church teaches on human sexuality and the so-called rules, but few of us will have ever been taught or understood the why. Why does the church adopt such a counter-cultural stance on sex and marriage? This talk will therefore go on to explain what theology of the body is and what theology of the body has contributed to with respect to finding out the why of church teaching. And it does so with a focus that is so far removed from rules, but in fact is founded upon what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. Thirdly, I will address the teaching on contraception in detail. And from the principles that I'll put forward there, you'll be able to see how they can be applied to other sexual moral issues such as adultery, same-sex acts, sex and cohabitation, pornography, etc. Once these foundations have been laid, the notion of reconciliation through the lens of theology of the body will be almost self-explanatory. So part one, let's then start with the hard facts. As you may know, the Catholic Church asserts an unequivocal position regarding marriage and sexual morality. To put it in very simple terms, the Catholic Church says that sexual intercourse should only ever take place within marriage, which is between one man and one woman, and must always be free from contraception. Now, depending on your age, you are likely to view this teaching through different lenses. If you are my generation, if you were taught anything at all on the topic of sex, you might have grown up believing that this teaching was simply a list of prohibitions and that all you needed to do was obey those rules and you'd be a good Catholic. Alternatively, you may have a modernist lens. You may be someone who believes that the church is out of date and needs to move with the times. Perhaps you were surprised recently when Pope Francis affirmed that it is not permissible to bless same-sex partnerships. Perhaps you cannot understand why same-sex partnerships are not recognised as marriage by the Catholic Church. You may be someone whose lens is tarnished with seeming hypocrisy, that perhaps you're struggling to recognise the gospel message of love with a belief that the sexual teachings of the Church seem entirely unloving and even unjust, that the Church professes love and then seems to impose unloving teachings. Or you may view the teaching through the lens of an abuse of power, that the teaching is simply the imposition of rigid, man-made laws by a hierarchical, patriarchal, celibate institution. And what right or expertise does such an institution have to tell us about sex and marriage? You may not be Catholic, you may wonder why the church has seemingly stringent teachings at all. So my aim then is that by the end of this talk, 
you will have a new and beautiful lens through which to begin to understand and communicate the sexual moral teaching of the Catholic Church. And as we will see as the talk unfolds, that lens is the lens of total self-gift. And I hope you'll come to understand that the teaching of the church is not founded on rules, but is founded on the truth of the human person and authentic human flourishing as gift. And that you'll then see more closely any areas in your own life which need to be reconciled with God. So part two then, let's turn our attention to theology of the body. What is it? And what does it tell us about sex and marriage? Firstly, what is it? It's a series of catechesis written and delivered by Pope John Paul II during his Wednesday audiences at St. Peter's between 1979 and 1984. Why did he write it? Well, John Paul II had a passion for what he termed fairest love, or what we might term authentic love. And I say authentic because in the English language, we use the same word love when we refer to something as mundane as I love coffee cake and I love tennis, which I do. And we use the same word when we refer to Christ's love for us in his passion and his self-sacrifice on the cross. So the English language is very poor at communicating different types of love. So to try and make a clear distinction, I will often prefix love with authentic when I'm referring to love as God intended it to be. Now, John Paul II could see in the signs of the times that this beautiful love, this authentic love, was under increasing threat. The repercussions from the work of the original architects of the sexual revolution of the 60s, the likes of Freud and Reich and Sanger, all of whom believed in the free availability of sexual pleasure, had really begun to take hold in the second half of the 20th century. Sex, as we know, has been reduced to a commodity, something to be consumed, to be used, to be discarded and degraded, totally divorced in many people's minds from marriage and procreation. In our culture today, then, sex has been emptied of its real meaning, and in the truest sense of the word, sex has become depersonalized. So theology of the body had as its ultimate goal the provision of a scriptural defense of Paul VI art, uh, encyclical Humanae Vitae, which affirmed the constant teaching of the church that contraception is wrong. But, and this is a big but, theology of the body does infinitely more than merely defend Humanae Vitae. It in fact furnishes us with a fully integrated and not disintegrated vision of man and woman. It furnishes us with a deeply personalist view of what it means to be a human person and how the human person should live. Now, I know that might all sound rather abstract, an integrated vision of the human person. Why should that even matter? But consider this, if I had never seen a laptop before, and if I was given a laptop, all I would know is that it's some form of metal plastic object. But without knowing what it is and its purpose, I wouldn't be able to interact with it. Similarly, the laptop would not be able to flourish in its purpose. It would be inhibited, unable to flourish. If we transfer that analogy to the human person, if we do not know our ultimate purpose, if we do not know who and what we are as human persons, then it's impossible for us to know how to act in a manner that serves our human flourishing and not harm it. So the questions that theology of the body answers are these. Who is the human person? What is our purpose? And how are we to live in a way that promotes our flourishing? And as we shall see, once these questions are answered, the lens for understanding the church's teaching on sex and marriage becomes much clearer. Now, in this short talk, I can only set out a few of the fundamental tenets of theology of the body, but I hope I can just set out enough for you to grasp a new understanding 
of the human person and how he or she should act. John Paul II took as his start point the discussion that uh, Jesus had with the Pharisees in Matthew 19, something that we're all very familiar with. This is when the Pharisees came to him to test him, and they were asking him about divorce. And Jesus replied, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And as you may recall, the Pharisees pressed him further and asked, well, why did Moses allow divorce? And Jesus responded again, Moses permitted you to divorce because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. So Jesus is clearly instructing the Pharisees to find the answer to their question on marriage, divorce, and sexual morals in the beginning. So John Paul II sets out in Theology of the Body to address with great precision the meaning of this beginning. The beginning to which Jesus refers is, of course, Genesis. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, if you want to know and understand what marriage really is, go back to Genesis. And again, we might ask, why? This is because Genesis contains the perennial truths pertaining to who and what the human person is and what the purpose of life is. So what I'll do now briefly is take you through some of those fundamental tenets of the human person as stated in Genesis and show how we are able to construct, as John Paul II did, an integrated identity of the human person. And we can then see how this identity plays out in marriage, our relationships, and of course, sexual morals. Genesis, as we know, takes us step by step through the story of creation. But when it comes to the creation of mankind, the creation of man and woman, John Paul II notes that God appears to halt before calling man into existence. He says, God, in effect, enters back into himself, almost like a conversation to make a decision. God says, let us make man in our own image and likeness. So the fundamental truth of the identity of the human person, then, is that we are the only creatures defined in relation to God the only creatures in his image and likeness. And then in Genesis 2.7, we learn that God blew into man the breath of life. The key truth here is that God is the source of life, not us. It is God that implants the human soul and breathes life into our being. Our parents do not create our souls. God does. Another fundamental truth is that life is the result of giftedness. God need not have created us at all. All the existence of creation is the result of gift from a loving God. So all creation, including man and woman, have been created by God who is pure gift. So just in these small opening sentences in Genesis, we are already provided with some rich veins of truth about the human person and that the animals are not referred to as being in the image and likeness of God. It is man and woman who possess a supreme value and dignity. But let's move a little deeper into this notion of image and likeness. Genesis states, Let us make man in our own image, in the likeness of ourselves. God created man in the image of himself. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, saying to them, be fruitful and multiply. So what do you note about this passage? What's striking? The reference to God moves between the singular and the plural. And yet Genesis was written before the incarnation and before Pentecost. 
So what is it that the ancient author is revealing to us through these grammatical shifts? He is, of course, revealing and affirming for us that God is love. The language is clearly indicating that God is relationship. The words used, us, ourselves, point to him being more than one person, which, since God is love itself, actually makes perfect sense. Because for love to exist, it must have a beloved to love. And so, of course, God is more than one person. Of course, God is relational. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So another fundamental truth of the human person is that we are created in the image and likeness of pure, loving relationship. Now, moving on, we learn in Genesis 2.18 that there was something yet to be completed by God. And we read, Yahweh God said, it is not right that man should be alone. And this is the state of what John Paul II terms original solitude. And here we learn that it's not good for the human person to be alone. As we've just stated, man is made in the image of pure, authentic relationship. In that case, man needs relationship in order to flourish. But what sort of relationship is needed? We read that God made all the animals and he brought these to man to name. But amidst all these lovely and beautiful creatures, no helper suitable for the man was found. So what does this tell us about the human person? It tells us that there are two aspects to original solitude, positive and negative. On the positive side, the fact that no helper suitable for man was found informs us that man, through the exercise of his cognitive skills, through his self-consciousness, through his body, came to the realization that he was not another animal, that he was not bestial, that he has a body and a soul, and that he alone has the capacity to be in a personal relationship with God. On the negative side, he's experiencing a sense of privation, as we've already mentioned, man is made in the image of a relational God. Without the presence of another person, man is unable to be in relationship. And yet he has this inbuilt need for communion. And this need for communion establishes his purpose. He has been made by love to love. And all of this experience is preparing the way for the presentation of woman. And there we read a little further on in Genesis that whilst man was asleep, Yahweh God fashioned the rib taken from man into woman and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Those two tiny words at last are amongst the most important in scripture. Why? They are so concise, and yet they are bursting at the seams with such profound meaning. In those two tiny words, we hear a beautiful expression of ecstatic joy and appreciation. In the phrase at last, we have from man the total affirmation and recognition of another human person, not an animal, not a thing. She is recognized instantly as a person of equal dignity, and thus she truly is the helpmate that he had been longing for. And only with and through her is he able to be in relationship and live out his vocation to love, to become a communion of persons, and thus be an authentic image of the Trinity. Through the presentation of Eve, man appreciates his own identity his purpose, his full understanding that he is called to make a gift of self, and she likewise. They both come from God, who is pure gift. So together, man and woman can establish God's loving plan of love. But more than that, through their sexual difference as man and woman, they are together capacitated to participate in God's fruitful and creative work. 
So at this moment of the beginning, prior to the arrival of original sin, man and woman are in a state of what John Paul II termed original nakedness. They were able to gaze upon one another and see not just a body, but see the whole integrated person at once. In other words, in original nakedness, Adam and Eve were able to see one another with the eyes of God. In our post-original sin world, we've lost that ability. And women in particular often sense this more acutely. Women can sense when they're being looked at. In these situations, women feel like they're being assessed and weighed up, evaluated and based purely on external superficial attractiveness. But when a woman is seen and seen properly, she knows that she's apprehended in her totality as a someone and not a something. As a person, body and soul, not just a body. So let's just pause for a moment and just consider the existence of sexual difference. Why did God elect to create two sexes, male and female? Why not just create more spirits, more angels? Or why not one sex beings like hermaphrodites who might self reproduce? Why design the perpetuation of the species through the sexual union of one man and one woman? What purpose does it serve for God to have created male and female? In deliberately choosing to create man and woman in his image and likeness, God must be communicating something of himself to us. But what is it? To answer this, let's first look at God. God, as we know, is the unity of three persons in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is an eternal, dynamic movement of pure, authentic love and pure, authentic gift. Therefore, we know that authentic love, remember I said that at the beginning of the talk, authentic love, by its very essence, must possess certain key essentials. Authentic love must be forever, it must be faithful, it must be fruitful, and it must be freely given. So let's now look at the creation of man and woman. It is through the existence of sexual difference that man and woman have the ability to literally become one flesh, to co-create with God a new life, a new human soul, and build a communion of life and love. And therefore, it's through the creation of sexual difference that man and woman are capacitated to image the community of the Trinity. John Paul II refers to man and woman creating a communio personarum, and this they do not by simply joining together bodily, but in being a union of persons, body and soul. So our sexuality as male and female is not limited to genitalia or biology. Our sexuality is part of our whole integrated being, body, mind, soul. And as science clearly demonstrates, our sex, male and female, is infused into every single cell in our being. John Paul II goes so far as to state that man becomes an image of God, not so much in the moment of solitude of one person, but in the moment of communion. A communion which is only made possible through sexual difference. Our bodies then, as male and female, reveal to us that we are made for union, made to be fruitful. And it's clear then that giftedness has in effect been stamped into our bodies as male and female. Our bodies reveal to us our fundamental identity to be a gift. And this is the nuptial or spousal meaning of the body, that we are created by love and our bodies carry the meaning of love and that they are specifically designed to express authentic love, which, as we've already said, by its very nature, is always fruitful. In summary, then, our bodies are a sacrament. We've been created male and female because our bodies make visible 
God's invisible, authentic love. Okay, so let's just take a moment, I know that's a lot to take in, to recap the truths of the human person that we have articulated so far. They are that the human person is defined in relation to God and made in the image and likeness of God, and therefore bears a supreme dignity and value. Being made in God's image, a God who is relational, means that man and woman have been created to be a reflection of God and his relational love, an authentic love that is eternal, free, faithful, and fruitful. Man and woman, through sexual difference, are capacitated to be co-creators with God and give birth to a new human soul. The human body, then, is sacramental, capable of making visible what is invisible, God's authentic love. So the identity of the human person is love, the vocation of the human person is love. But remember, this love is founded on God, so it's a love that is totally self-giving, self-sacrificing, self-donating, and never self-serving. The mere fact that Christ took on human form, a human body, attests to the fact that the body is deeply theological. As John Paul II says, through the fact that the word of God became flesh, the body entered theology. Our bodies have been designed to speak of God, and therefore they must speak in truth. Now, I know you might well be thinking, well, what has all of that got to do with reconciliation, marriage, and sexual morals? But remember, we said at the beginning that we needed to understand who and what the human person is in order for us to be able to evaluate what is and is not good for our human flourishing. So what I'm going to do now is apply these truths of the human person to some of the so-called difficult teachings of the church. And I'm going to start, as I said at the beginning, with contraception, and the others I'll cover uh, more briefly. So what I hope you'll come to understand is that the teaching of the church is not founded on rigid rules, but on the truths of the human person that I've set out so far and the call to self-gift. And that these principles, once apprehended, can be applied to all the other sexual, moral and identity issues facing us. Now, many Catholics struggle to understand what is wrong with separating the unitive aspect of sexual act or the conjugal act in marriage from the procreative aspect. In other words, many Catholics cannot understand what is wrong with contraception in marriage. And the argument will go something like this, that the marital sexual act has two purposes, uh, a biological procreative function, if you like, and a unitive function. And whilst the marital act is a procreative type of act, It is really, above all else, an act of love. Contraception does prevent the procreative function, but many Catholics will argue it does not inhibit or damage the unitive function. In fact, a great many would argue that contraception enables couples to express their marital love without any fear or tension. In other words, they would state that whilst contraception nullifies the procreative aspect, it leaves untouched the unitive aspect, and therefore it remains an act of love and union. So quite naturally, they will ask, why does the church obstinately maintain in her constant teaching that the unitive and the procreative dimension of the act are inseparable and that contraception is prohibited? What is it then? about the true nature of the sexual act in marriage that demands such an exceptionless moral norm. In fact, one might simply ask, why is the sexual act regarded as the act of marriage, its consummation? Why is it regarded as any sort of act of union at all? So let's just probe the notion of union a little more deeply. We've already shown that since we are human persons, created body and soul, that the body expresses not just biology, it expresses the whole person, body and soul. For example, if someone strikes us, we don't say, you hit the body, we say, you hit me. 
I am my whole body and my complete being includes the capacity for fertility. Fertility is a fundamental element of the human person. It is part of the deepest essential structure of men and women. Now, the sexual act in marriage is a deeply personal um, act and to deliberately withhold fertility is to withhold a defining feature of a deeply personal act. As Newton explains, it's in using contraception that a person treats the body as a means for union, but simultaneously neuters the procreative dimension, thereby implying that the procreative aspect is not essentially part of the person. So with contraception, there is a bodily union, but not a fully personalist union, because an essential element of the person has been negated. Let's examine this notion of union a little more deeply. We're all familiar with the concept of body language. So we need to ask, what is it that the marital act communicates, and in particular, what aspect of union is being communicated in and through the sexual act in marriage? The answer is that what is communicated in the conjugal act is the sharing of life-giving power. And this is what makes every particular spousal union unique, the sharing of life-giving power. In other words, the gift of self in the conjugal act is not merely a gift of heart, one to the other, but a gift of entire personhood, a union of entire personhood. I give to you what I give to no one else on earth. No other relationship that we have entails such unique, powerful, meaningful giving. In the sexual act of communion, what is communicated is, I give to you what I give to no one else on this planet. And as we all know, we shake hands with people that we sort of know. We kiss those that we know a little better. We kiss and hug those that we are very close to. And all of these bodily acts can be done with multiple people throughout our entire lives. But the conjugal act, the sexual union of a husband and wife, is a particular act of intimate union. And what makes intercourse between spouses a unique expression of their distinctive conjugal union is their shared procreative power. In each and every individual marital act, the other is being reaffirmed once more as the one uniquely chosen to be the recipient of a personal gift, a gift which is actually witnessed objectively by the husband's seed in the wife's body. By contrast, in using contraception, there is no unique power present, nor any unique sharing, except a power to produce shared pleasure. Now, of course, that's not to say that couples that use contraception don't sincerely unite in a genuine love for one another. That's not what's being said. What is being said that objectively, their acts do not specifically express their conjugal uniqueness. If the procreative orientation is deliberately frustrated through contraception, then it no longer unites the spouses in any distinctively conjugal way. And so the very nature of the act is altered. Now, some might argue that spouses are united in a union of pleasure, and of course that may be true. But pleasure is fleeting and it doesn't last. But what does last is the significance and the meaning of the conjugal act. So as we've said, waving, hugging, kissing are all gestures that signify love and relationship. But the marital act is not a gesture. It actually involves a real and objective exchange of the gift of self one to the other. An exchange of giftedness that is objectively witnessed by the husband's seed in the wife's body. Therefore, if one uses contraception to nullify the procreative dimension of the conjugal act, one actually destroys the ability of the act to signify true and authentic union. The act is reduced to an act of pleasure, its significance gone, 
and the unitive meaning emptied. Remember, the union, the unitive aspect, is founded upon the unique, shared, life-giving power of the couple, something that they share with no one else on earth. So contraception doesn't just sever the procreative dimension of the act, but it affects the unitive function as well. Now, I know, I'm sure, that there'll be many listening to this saying, well, that's all very idealistic and theoretical, but it's not real life. So what I want to do now is just share with you just a few excerpts from my research with young couples. Um, and just to let you hear some real voices of lived experience. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Hattie. She was not a Catholic, but she did convert to Catholicism. So when I interviewed Hattie, she said to me, prior to becoming Catholic, I was sent to a family in America to be a nanny. And the family that she was sent to was Catholic. And Hattie said in her interview, the parents there were using natural family planning. And I saw that there was a real beauty to it. I saw firsthand there was something I couldn't put my finger on. There was something very special. And it started to grow in me, you know, this conviction that the Catholic Church was right. Hattie then went on to explain how over time her understanding of contraception had evolved to the point where she now viewed sex with contraception as an entirely different act. She said, contraception changes what sex is for you because, you know, if it doesn't have the consequence of a potential child, it's a different act. And she continued, I think sex without contraception has more weight to it. It's more of a serious act. It gives it a different level. I just can't put it into words. So what Hattie was trying to articulate then was that the conjugal act free from contraception was viewed as a more serious act, had more gravitas, was on a different level. Hattie's perception was that contraception reduced the conjugal act to something less than it should be. In essence, she is expressing the lack of shared life-giving power. Leo was one of the male participants that I interviewed, and he said this, Love's a wonderful thing, and giving love to your wife is a great act of love. And I guess you're just devaluing it by using contraception. Love's always life-giving, and that just sort of takes it away. So that's a tiny sample of what some of the young people articulated from their personal lived experience. The fact that contraception left sex as a devalued lesser act. Sex loses its true value because it's an incomplete gift. So in summary, the lived experience of the couples in my research revealed that the unitive and the procreative dimensions of the sexual act should not be separated. Why? Because the truth of the human person, body and soul, is that we are called to make a total gift of self. Now, as I said at the beginning, once we'd examined contraception, the lens for self-gift, then the lens that we have, we've been given to look at other moral issues. So in this next section, let's apply the lens of total self-gift and the truth of the human person made in the image and likeness of God to some of the other difficult teachings in the church. And I'm just going to do these very briefly. So firstly... Masturbation is always wrong, not because the church says so, but because it violates the truth of the human person made in the image and likeness of God. Someone who is called to make a fruitful gift of self in authentic love, not to abuse and degrade the body for self-gratifying pleasure. Adultery is always wrong because it takes the gift given by a spouse, tramples on it, and objectively rejects their gift out of disordered lust for another. Fornication, sex outside marriage is wrong because there is an objective failure to make a total gift of self which the dignity of the human person demands. Here, sex is used for pleasure with no objective commitment to give oneself in love forever. And the language of the body is thereby falsified and that's an offence to the dignity and truth of the human person. 
Pornography regards the person as a thing, as an object. In fact, as is often said, the problem with pornography is not that it shows too much, but that it shows too little. It reduces men and women to nothing more than bodies. It fails to see the truth and dignity of the whole person who is created body and soul for authentic love. Same-sex acts are always wrong because some such acts can never signify the total gift of self one to another and can never signify the type of union required of marriage, a union of unique, shared, life-giving power. It is an objective impossibility for the two to become one flesh, which marriage, by its very definition, demands. So there can be no authentic marriage. The sexual act remains an act of separate individuals. It's never an act of the full one flesh union, and therefore, it doesn't possess the capacity to image the Trinity. Changing sex is metaphysically and biologically not possible because our sex as male and female permeates our whole being, body and soul and every cell of our being. So to conclude then, these are just some of the areas in our life that we need to prayerfully examine and ask the Holy Spirit's guidance in preparing us for the sacrament of reconciliation, where we can honestly and humbly take our sins and place them at the foot of the cross. We all often fail to behave as ones who have received a great gift and with a mission to be a gift. Our passions are often disordered, directed at our own desires and pleasure, and not directed at self-sacrifice and making a total gift of self. Instead of letting our intellect rule our passions, we let our passions rule us. And our lens for seeing ourselves and others as a gift becomes clouded. Every one of us is wounded. Our daily and sometimes exhausting battle is with ourselves. Remember that theology of the body is not limited to sexual morals and marriage. Remember that our whole life is lived in and through the body. And everything that we do or fail to do is done in and through the body. So the constant battle is one against our own desires, temptations, our greed, lust, pride, envy, jealousy, whatever our personal struggles may be. And we can all fall into the trap of thinking that we're better than we actually are. And we can play down our sinfulness and make excuses. But we need to be alert to our personal sins regularly examining our conscience, knowing and naming our sins, and being humble and being honest, and being open to receiving grace in the sacrament of confession, and sincerely resolving to do better. And that's the only way that we can become better Christians. And don't let embarrassment or shame hinder you from going to confession. Take heart from the words of St. Paul himself. I do not understand what I do, for I do the things I hate. I'm sure we can all relate to that quote, this constant struggle to overcome a tendency to sin. But there are no new sins, and our wonderful priests are all quite unshockable. Remember also that we have been redeemed by Christ. As St. Paul says, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And we hear this all the time in church, don't we? That Christ came to redeem us. But how often do we actually reflect on what it is that he is actually redeeming? What is realized by Christ's redeeming power and resurrection is nothing other than God's original plan for human love. What is being redeemed in us, in fact, by Christ, is the teaching about the beginning. And this is why it's vital that we take the time to go back to the beginning, to understand God's original plan for us and our lives. And to redeem us, God gifted us his only son, a gift to us to draw us back to him, to in effect direct us back to life as it was in the beginning. And as Newton argues, it wouldn't be fair for Jesus to exhort us to adhere 
to the demands of love and fidelity, as it was in the beginning, if he hadn't also provided us with the means to do so. And I quote, it's not easy for man wounded by sin to maintain moral balance. Christ's gift of salvation offers us the grace necessary to persevere in the pursuit of the virtues. Everyone should always ask for this grace of light and strength, frequent the sacraments, cooperate with the Holy Spirit, and follow his calls to love what is good and shun evil. So do please take this opportunity to avail yourself of the wonderful gift of grace awaiting you in confession. And for all those watching who are unable to avail themselves of confession at the present time, remember that the Catechism makes reference to making a perfect act of contrition, provided that one seeks sacramental confession as soon as feasibly possible. I'll conclude then with leaving the final words to St. John Paul II. We have been given the body as a task. The task is theological. The body, male and female, has a specific and divine mission. And that mission is to transfer into the visible reality of the world the mystery hidden from eternity in God, and thus to be a sign of it. And that great mystery is sacrificial, authentic love. Thank you.